Welcome, my friends, to a place where we share inspiration and positivity. Welcome to our channel, where today's focus is all about Buddy Bear. Let's get started. Jacob Henry Buddy Bear, June 11, 1915, July 18, 1986, was an American boxer and later an actor with important parts in 17 films, as well as roles on various television series in The Urs and Urs. In 1941, he came extremely close to boxing stardom at Washington's Griffiths Stadium, when in the opinion of most ringside officials, Joe Lewis gave him a disqualifying late six-round hit in a title match that should have made Bear the world heavyweight champion. He lost to Lewis in a rematch for the title the following year but remained solidly ranked among the top heavyweights in the early years. In 2003, Bear was chosen for the Ring Magazine's list of 100 greatest punches of all time. He was the younger brother of boxing heavyweight champion and actor Max Bear, and the uncle of actor Max Bear Jr. Now, we shift our focus to boxing career, a topic that deserves our attention. Bear was born in Denver, Colorado, on June 11, 1915, to father Jacob, a butcher, and mother Dora Bales. A few sources list his birthplace, like his brother Max, as Omaha, Nebraska. He moved with his family to California in 1928, living first in Livermore in 1926 and then Hayward, before settling in the early years in Sacramento, where he would later retire. Both Buddy and his brother Max had a large Jewish following, for they claimed Jewish ancestry on their father's side and frequently wore a Star of David on their boxing trunks. Neither brother, however, appeared to be observant or openly religious, and the claims of Jewish heritage were questioned by legendary trainer Ray Arsel. Standing at 61.99 m. Bear fought from 1934 to 1942 and was one of the best punchers of his era. Bear's manager during the largest portion of his boxing career was Ansel Hoffman, who also managed Max's career for a period. Let's now turn our attention to early career and examine its role within the larger context. In his professional debut, Bear knocked out Tiny Abbott, 154 into the first round on September 23, 1934 in Eureka, California. A boxer of some repute, the towering 6'8 Abbott had twice faced Bear's brother Max, and though it was Bear's first time in the ring, the more experienced Abbott was nearing the end of his career. Bear had a long winning streak following his debut fight until he met Babe Hunt. On January 10, 1935, Bear was defeated in a four-round bout, losing on points to Hunt at Boston's Rickard Recreation Center. The loss was Bear's first in 13 straight fights, 12 of which Bear won by knockout. Though Hunt had a bad second round, he came back strongly in the third and fourth to win by unanimous decision. He completed a technical knockout of Jack O'Dowd at 2.10 into the second round at Detroit's Olympia Stadium on January 4, 1935. On a ticket that included Joe Lewis, the total audience reached 15,853. The sizable crowd witnessed an exceptional performance from Bear, who outweighed his opponent by 29 pounds, less than his typical advantage. In an odd victory, O'Dowd, who seemed to lack the will to fight, was down five times in the first round, in a few instances without actually being hit. Though Dowd had faced the great Joe Lewis the previous year, he showed no desire to mix with Bear and appeared thoroughly outmatched. Frank Connolly, a former Golden Gloves champion, fell to Bear on March 20, 1935, in a convincing first-round knockout at the Oakland Auditorium before a substantial early career crowd of 9,500. The final blow was a right hook that started low and came up with enormous power to knock out Connolly who weighed 245, only a pound heavier than Bear. Bear defeated Al Delaney on July 18, 1935, in a four-round knockout at Buffalo's Offerman Stadium. In a complete victory, Bear had Delaney down five times before the referee counted him out 34 seconds into the fourth round from a right behind the ear. In the opening round, Bear was knocked to his knees by a strong left, but he recovered, and had his own way for the rest of the match. 
get ready to uncover the mysteries surrounding match with Ford Smith as we navigate its intriguing terrain. On the ticket of the Max Bed Joe Lewis match, he had one of his most lucrative bouts on September 4, 1935, when he lost a six-round win-up match to Ford Smith in New York before an immense crowd of 90,000 fans at Yankee Stadium. Bear tried to overpower Smith in the early rounds with his legendary punching ability, but Smith moved, blocked and weathered the storm. In later rounds, Bear was less effective with intermittent looping blows that Smith countered with sharp, short punches to the body. Bear tired in the last round, and though he had an advantage in reach and weight, he did little damage in his final rally, having lost speed and precision in his blows. The more experience Smith took for of the six rounds. According to one source, his purse for the match, which was the most heavily attended in New York history, was a remarkable $42,000. Lewis, who won the title match against Brother Max, had a purse of $200,000. At this early stage of his career, Bear suffered a rare loss on April 22, 1936, dropping a six-round decision to Frenchman André Lengelt at Oton's Municipal Auditorium. Bear looked strong in the first and had a brief promising rally in the fifth but lost his chance when Lengelt snapped back with a strong defence. One reporter, who wrote that Lengelt won each round by a large margin, noted that Bear failed to score with a telling blow throughout the match. Lengelt scored well with short left jabs to the face and follow-ups to the midriff and his frequent changes of pace confused Bear's ability to use his strong right. In an important match on May 24, 1937, Bear outpointed Jack London, later the holder of the Commonwealth Boxing Council's heavyweight title from 1944 to 1945. Bear won on points in a 10-round decision at Swansea, England, and though he had a significant advantage in height of nearly 8 inches, he had only 20 pounds in weight over the sturdy London boxer. Two weeks earlier, Bear had defeated Jim Wilde at Haringey Arena in a fourth-round technical knockout. With clear dominance and impressive punching power, he had Wilde down three times in the first round and for a count of eight in the third. After being knocked to the canvas for a count of five in the opening of the fourth, the referee called the match. British rules required ending about after five knockdowns. The time has come to unravel the secrets behind match with top contender Abe Simon and gain a deeper understanding. He brought a stop to seasoned Jewish heavyweight Abe Simon before 25,000 fans on August 30, 1937, scoring a technical knockout at Yankee Stadium in 238 of the third round. Though Simon punished Bear severely in the first and had him hanging from the ropes with a two-fisted attack, Bear rallied in the second with sharp left jabs and a stinging right cross and had Simon down and then staggering in the third when the referee called the fight. Both fighters had exceptional weight and reach and though Bear had a two-inch advantage in height, Simon, a giant himself, actually outweighed Bear by seven pounds. In the following section, we'll be immersing ourselves in the captivating world of painful loss to Gunnar Berlund. Bear lost to gifted Finnish boxer Gunnar Berlund on March 4, 1938, before 8,565 fans in a seventh-round technical knockout at Madison Square Garden. Bear had a 40-pound weight advantage over Berlund, and inch advantage in height, but lacked stamina and heart as the fight progressed. Bear performed well in the first, cutting Berlund's forehead and nose with stinging left jabs and an occasional right, while Berlund lost points for low blows. In the second, however, Gunner reached Bear with a few punches and then getting his range, took the second, third, and fourth. Bear maintained an edge in the fifth, and though both showed fatigue, Gunner took the sixth, scoring at least ten straight rights and lefts without a return. In the seventh, Berlund drove Bear into the ropes with a heavy barrage. He followed him across the ring when Bear retreated and continued his attack, Bear seeming to give up, dropping his hands to his sides during the attack, and after coming from a clinch signaling the referee to end the fight. The referee asked Bear, apparently hurt, if he wished to continue, and decided to stop the fight, 1.36 into the 7th. 
Bear made no excuses for his performances but believed his layoff from the ring had affected his timing and ability to connect punches, particularly his right. Balun successfully circled away from Bear's hard overhand right. Brace yourself for a deep dive into three wins, Savold, Man, and Blackshare as we explore its impact and relevance in our evolving narrative. He defeated Lee Savold in an important match on October 30, 1939, in an eight-round newspaper decision before 3,500 in Des Moines, Iowa. After a brief exchange, Bear had his opponent down for a count of eight in the first round from a right uppercut, and though Savold battled hard in the remaining rounds, he struggled to connect blows after his rough first round. Most reporters gave five rounds to Bear with only two to Savold in the hotly contested match. He defeated Nathan Mann on May 3, 1940, before 5,000, in a seventh round technical knockout at New York's Madison Square Garden. In the match, Bear took the first four rounds, but Mann took the next four with cutting hooks to the head and body. A savage right hook in the opening of the seventh severely cut Mann's eye, causing his handlers to end the fight. Winning in a three-round technical knockout before 4,000 fans, he defeated accomplished boxer Harold Blackshear, who maintained a winning record and a 50% knockout percentage, on December 17, 1940 at Oakland's auditorium. They had the advantages of roughly 5 inches in reach, 5.5 inches in height, and 49 pounds in weight, as well as his superior punching ability. He toyed with Blackshear for the first two and a half rounds, before commencing a clubbing and brutal assault in the third that led to the end of the charity bout. Many at ringside considered the bout a mismatch. Although he pocketed 2,000, $500 for the contest, Bear had faced stronger opposition in the recent past, as Blackshear had dropped his last two fights, suffering a loss and a strong knockout. Brace yourselves for the next chapter, where we'll be dissecting loss to Eddie Blunt in Oakland. Bear lost to Eddie Blunt on January 15, 1941, at the auditorium in Oakland in a 10-round points decision. Though Bear was a 3-1 favourite in the early betting, Blunt won 8 of the 10 rounds. Despite a weight disadvantage of 24 pounds, Blunt kept Bear off balance with long lifts and stiff uppercuts throughout the match, and by the fifth had cut Bear's eyes, after which Bear kept losing ground. The fifth through seventh rounds were hard fought with both boxers fighting toe to toe. Though Bear attempted a rally in the 10th, it was far too late to make up the points differential, though he managed to win the round. In the words of one reporter, Bear took one of the most beautiful shellackings of his erratic career. Bear required stitches above both eyes, and it was evident he would need a break before his next fight. In a ramp up to a heavyweight title match, he defeated colourful contender Tony Galento before 8,500 fans on April 8. 1941, in a seventh round technical knockout in Washington, D.C., when Galinto had to discontinue the bout due to a broken hand. Galinto took the first round backing Bear into the ropes with a few hard rights, but the second was even, and Bear took the remaining rounds. Bear used his superior reach in the remaining rounds to keep Galinto from boring in, and in the fourth, he staggered Galinto with a hard right to the mouth. Another solid blow in the sixth caused Galinto to lose his mouthpiece, and there were some hard punches, but the match featured no knockdowns. The win was a solid one for Bear. Bear succeeded in connecting with solid lefts to Galinto's head and both lefts and rights to his body. Now, let's shift our perspective and explore world heavy title contender from a different angle. A writer left them, Joe Lewis, 1941. The highlight of his boxing career came in his two attempts to take the heavyweight boxing championship from Joe Lewis. In their first fight on May 23, 1941, Bear caught Lewis with a powerful left hook in the first round and knocked the champion out of the ring. Lewis, however, hurt but unfazed, climbed back in before the count of ten, though many ringside believed Lewis benefited from a long count. Lewis eventually won the fight on a disqualification after he had knocked down Bear three times in the six. Bear claimed that his third knockdown came shortly after the bell had rung to end the sixth round. 
In the seventh, when Bear's handlers refused to leave the ring as they protested what they believed was a late hit in the sixth, the referee, Arthur Donovan, disqualified Bear in a technical knockout for not resuming the match. In a controversial decision, the referee believed the last hit came before or during the final bell, but most ringside officials, including the official Tim Keeper, knockdown Tim Keeper, and both judges believed the final blow came after the bell which should have disqualified Lewis. The final decision of the Boxing Commissioner favoured the referee, and Lewis retained the title. Regardless of the decision, many ringside believed Lewis would have eventually won the fight, as he punished Bear repeatedly in the sixth, and had fully recovered from his knockdown in the first. Bear, nonetheless, came closer to defeating Lewis and taking the title than any of the other opponents Lewis would face, until losing to Edsard Charles in 1950. In their rematch in Madison Square Garden, on January 9, 1942, before an estimated crowd of 19,000, Lewis knocked Bear out in the first, after downing him to previous times. His second knockdown, after a barrage of blows and a thundering left hook, resulted in a count of nine. After rising to his feet again, Bear was battered around the ring and floored for the last time with a straight right to the head that put him down for a seven count. Unable to get up, the count was completed and the fight ended. Bear subsequently remarked, The only way I could have beaten Lewis that night was with a baseball bat. A year later he said, I had to quit. I injured my neck in an auto crash before the fight. Moving forward, we'll be taking a closer look at professional boxing record. All information in this section is derived from BoxRec, unless otherwise stated. In this part of the video, we'll be diving deep into official record and unraveling its profound impact. All newspaper decisions are officially regarded as no decision bouts and are not counted in the winless draw column. Our focus now turns to unofficial record an important aspect of our discussion. Record with the inclusion of newspaper decisions in the winless draw column. Turning our focus to afterboxing, let's explore its key elements. Bear retired from boxing after the second Lewis bout and enlisted in the United States Army Air Forces at McClellan Air Force Base in 1942, the early years of America's involvement in World War II. With the war over, and his army discharge complete in September 1945, he returned to Sacramento and started his most successful business, Buddy Bear's Bar of Music at 1411 11th Street, which he opened with Fred Cullensini. He dabbled with less success in a variety of other businesses including a health food store, a clothing shop, heavy equipment sales and real estate. After his brother Max's death in 1959 of a heart ailment, he served as the national chairman for the Fraternal Order of Eagles Max Bear Heart Fund. He later worked as a marshal or sergeant at arms for the California State Legislature in the ERS. For a number of years he supported himself as a nightclub singer, putting his bass baritone voice to use at such places as New York's Leon and Eddie's, and the Charles Club in Baltimore. He performed in 1952 with Pearl Bailey at the Paramount Theatre in New York. Now, let's shift our focus to final years and embark on an intellectual exploration of its various dimensions. Bear's last years were spent battling ailments that included diabetes, hypertension, and Alzheimer's disease. After a transfer from Sutter Memorial Hospital, he was admitted to the Martinez Veterans Hospital one week before his death and died on July 18, 1986, in Martinez, California. He was survived by his wife Vicky Ferrell Brumbelow whom he had married in their daughter Sheila, and three grandchildren. Bear had three previous marriages. His body is buried in East Lawn Sierra Hills Memorial Park in Sacramento. Both Buddy and his brother Max were known as the professional good guys or the genial giants. After their deaths, Sacramento sports reporter Billy Conlon wrote, When they died, the sweet science lost two of the sweetest. Let's now zoom in on partial filmography and uncover the hidden gems that lie within. 
Take It From Me 1937 Kid Brody After the Screams 1949 Boots Will Send Quo Vadis 1951 Assess Digius Bodyguard 2 Tickets to Broadway 1951 Sailor on Bus Flame of Araby 1951 Hakeem Barbarossa Jack and the Benstock 1952 Sergeant Riley the Giant the Big Sky 1952 Romain Fair Winter Jova 1953 King Dream Wife 1953 Vizier the Marshal's Daughter 1953 Bud the Bear Poker Game Player Jubilee Trail 1954 Nikolai Gregorovich Karko's Handsome Brute Slightly Scarlet 1956 Lenhart Hell Canyon Outlaws 1957 Henchman Stand Giant from the Unknown 1958 Vargas the Giant Once Upon a Horse 1958 Boers Brother Snow White and the Three Stooges 1961 Hordred the Magic Fountain 1961 Big Benjamin Voice the Bashful Elephant 1962 Tavern Owner Ride Beyond Vengeance 1966 Mr. Kratz Final Film Role As we enter this new phase, let's navigate the complexities of television and discover its practical applications. In 1957 Bear appeared in an episode of television's Gunsmoke, the episode entitled, Never Pestered Chester. In 1958, Bear appeared in an episode of the syndicated Adventures of Superman TV series, playing the role of Atlas, a circus strongman, who is duped by his fellow circus performers into stealing for them. They tell him that Superman is a crook and that he can help right the man of steel's wrongs by doing so. In 1958, Bear appeared in Season 1 Episode 33 of Wagon Train, The Daniel Hogan Story. He played a boxer nicknamed The Tinsmith. Bear's other television credits included guest roles on The Abbott and Costello Show, Adventures of Superman, Captain Midnight, Cheyenne, Circus Boy, Climax, Have Tenant Will Travel, Peter Gunn, Rawhide, Sky King, Wagon Train, Tales of the Vikings, Toast of the Town, and in the adventure series Sheena, Queen of the Jungle. Bear's most memorable character role was, perhaps, Stobo, on the aforementioned episode of Gunsmoke. Thank you for watching. I appreciate your support and I'll see you in the next video.